Amen. Amen. They forgot to say it, but if you're new, welcome. It's a new life. There's a card in the seat back in front of you. If you'd like, you take, I thought we got rid of this, and now I'm doing it again. There's a card in the seat back in front of you. If you want, you can scan that QR code or fill it in the old-fashioned way. Turn it in on your way out today. There's a free gift bag, a little coffee mug, a whole bunch of stuff we'd love to bless you with. Would you welcome our visitors today? Also want to apologize if it's a little chilly in here. I know it's always cold in here, but our heater kind of went down this weekend. So we've been trying to get it back going again. And my dad texted me early this morning and said, the heat might not be working in church. And I know you get chilly. And so I said, (laughs) fine, I will triple layer. I will put on my coat of many colors because I am my father's favorite son. And I will be nice and toasty while everyone else freezes. And I just want you to know the type of pastor that I am because I said to my dad, should we tell everyone this? You know, should we shoot a text out? Should we let people know? And he said, no, they'll be fine. So (laughs) it'll keep them awake. It'll keep them awake. That's it. I'll keep them awake. Uh, My name's Luke, sorry, I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my job to bring God's Word to you today on this Palm Sunday. Not used to having ice on the ground on Palm Sunday, but we'll make do with what we have. And uh, I hope, like I said in the video announcements, I hope that you're ready for everything that this coming weekend has to offer. Good Friday, Easter Sunday at Trumbull High, you're coming, right? You're going to be there. Very excited, very, very excited about all that God is doing. And then the week after, we're going to three services. <laughs> we're going to try our best to go to three services. It might be just the month of April, and we'll say, I ah, forget it, we're going back to two. But we're going to try our best. Well, you know, it's, it's, you know it, l- listen, uh, yeah, I, I can't take this much time visiting because we're not, I'm not going to make it. Uh, but, you know, we got, we got problems. But that's okay. They're good problems. We love to worship. We love the Word. Some of us love to talk. Amen. And uh, we'll, we'll make it work through the power of the Lord. We'll make it work because we're going we're gonna to need it. Uh, Uh, God is doing some incredible things here at New Life, and I love this series that we've been in uh, over the last uh, three weeks, now into the fourth week, where we've been going uh, chronologically through the things that Jesus said. And uh, again, like we say every time we get up here, I don't have time to recap, but you understand if you were here last week. If you weren't here last week, you need to go back and you need to listen. If If you missed any of the weeks... Because they, they do go in chronological order, and there's, a, there's kind of this ongoing theme like we learned about last week, that there's this process that Jesus is kind of subtly taking us through as he communicates his first words here on earth, where he says in his first documented red-letter words that, hey, I'm, I'm about my father's business. I, 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 this is what I'm here for. I'm not, I'm not here for, for all you. I'm here to do what, what my father's called me to do. And what is that? Well, in his second words, we hear it, that he's here to fulfill all righteousness. He's here to rescue us because we can't be righteous on our own. We need his righteousness in order to make heaven. And then a powerful message last week, like I said, go back and listen to it where Jesus is having this ongoing discussion with the devil and continues to respond to him with, it is written. That I need to be in the word of God. I need to submerse myself in his word so that I can face any problem that life would throw at me. Today I want to continue on this theme, and if you cheated and you Googled it or you looked it up, uh, as soon as I say my title, you're going to know exactly what it is that we're talking about today. But my title today is simply... Let's go fishing. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> All right, man. Wait till church gets out, buddy. <laughs> Sheesh. Yeah. Was that Pastor Andy? No. 
That guy's tying lures back there or something. Uh, it's ready. Let's go fishing. We need to learn how to fish. I'm not a big outdoorsman. I've told you this before. You can probably tell by the way I'm dressed that I'm not a big outdoorsman. Uh, I mean, you were thinking it, so I figured I might as well. I'm not a big outdoorsman. I went fishing. Uh, <laughs> went fishing. Me and my, my cousin Frank went fishing with my dad once when I was little. And uh, about 20 minutes into it, my dad yelled at both of us to shut up um, because we were talking too much. And he was like, you won't catch the fish. They're going to hear you talking. Just shut up. And we're like, what are we out here for? Like, I think I was like seven and he was like 10 or 11. And we looked at each other and we're like, let's just go play sports. This is ridiculous. Uh, and that was probably the last time I've ever been fishing. But so I'm not a big fisherman, but I do know a lot of fishermen. I, Pastor Andy's a, he's a accomplished fly fisherman. He, and uh, he drove the bus this year for our, he was my assistant coach on the basketball team that I coached. And so we got to coach together and he always drove the bus. And so on all of our trips, he would sit in the bus and, and all, a lot of the games we play would be in upstate Connecticut. You know, we're going to Litchfield and West Hartford and Simsbury and we're driving all up there. And, and I kid you not, if we went on a drive where he was not like, oh, look at that stream over there. Look at that stream. Look at that stream over there. I mean, like over and over. Look at that. Look at that stream over there. Look at that stream. I, I, I fished in that stream once. I, I was like, that's a great stream. They got great fish. I'm like, great, man. That's awesome. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. You know, is, it, is there bears? Is there bears over there? That's all I'm concerned with. I, I, I know a lot of fishermen. I don't know a lot about fishing, but I know a lot of fishermen. And I know that fishing takes work. It takes patience. But I also know that if you don't cast the line, you can't catch a fish. If I just stand on the bank of a stream and I go, here, fish, here, fishy, fishy, here, here, fish, it doesn't work like that. If I hold the, the fish food in my hand and kind of hope that they're just going to, it doesn't work like that. You, you got you to gotta cast the line. And then sometimes you got to cast the line and you got to wait and you get nothing. And then you got to reel it back in and you got to cast it again. And you got to reel it back in and you got to cast. It's a horrible sport. I don't know how any of you do it. And you got to cast it again. And you got to reel it back in. And you got to cast it again. And, gotta, and then the worst part, you catch it. Wow, this is beautiful. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. Don't come to me after. It's relaxing, Pastor. You go have a relaxing time on your own. That does not sound relaxing to me. That sounds frustrating. I want to talk to you today about going fishing. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 through 20, it says, As Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he noticed two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me as my disciples, accepting me as your master and teacher and walking the same path of life that I walk. And I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him, becoming his disciples, believing and trusting in him and following his example. This is an incredible moment in the life of Jesus, but it's also an incredible moment in the life of Peter and Andrew. My goodness, the privilege, the honor that Jesus would actually choose them to be his disciples, to be his followers. The word in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, you, should, you know, you should, I know we say that a lot up here. If you, I know most of you have it. Well, I don't know if you have a dictionary at home. I don't know if people still have a dictionary at home because most people can just look it up. But I would encourage you whenever you look up a word. I was taught from a very young age. You know, these people nowadays that write, they don't know what they're talking about. So you got to go back in time, right? Webster's 1828 Dictionary, listen to this, this definition. It says, one who comes, goes, or moves after another in the same course. One that takes another as his guide in doctrines, opinions, or example. One who receives the opinions and imitates the example of another. An adherent, an imitator. One who obeys, worships, and honors. Jesus calls his disciples. He calls these first two disciples and says, listen, come follow me. But I don't want you to just follow me just to follow me. I, I want you to follow me for a purpose. And the purpose is... 
we got to reach the lost. The purpose is we, we got to become fishers of men. So guess what? You get to follow me around a little bit. You get to listen to my doctrines, my opinions, watch my example. And then I want you to imitate me. Jesus is calling all of us to do this, to be fishers of men, of people. He wants us to go out into the community. He wants us to go out into our job, into the marketplace, into our our schools. And he wants us to be exactly what he's calling these men to be in this verse. And so today what I want to do is, guess what? That was my introduction. <laughs> Today, what I want to do is I want, I want, to, I want to dive right in. <laughs> I, I, I want to try to figure out today, man, how, how, how can I become someone that, that imitates Jesus, that follows after him? Sure. But how do I become someone that, that does exactly what Jesus is calling us to do? How do I become someone that learns how to be a fisher of men? And so this quickly, I'll give them to you. The first one is this. Following Jesus begins with seeing yourself as a failure. How encouraging. You understand that you're never going to be able to reach the lost if you don't realize how lost you once were and how lost you still are sometimes. If I don't come to the realization that I'm a failure sometimes, that I'm sinful, I, 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 can't, I can't reach the lost. Why? Because I'm going to think, oh, you know how hard it is to reach somebody when you think you're, I'm, I'm so much better than them? Watch me, and, watch me pour. You know how hard it is for someone to, you ever had someone try to pour wisdom or knowledge or leadership into you, but they act like they're uh, way better than you? You sit there the whole time going, mm-hmm, sure, mm-hmm, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. But when someone comes alongside you, and they're not talking down to you, but they're talking to you, and they begin to try to show you something in life, and they, they become your equal, all of a sudden, what do you want to do? You, you want to gain more and more wisdom, more and more knowledge from them. When someone comes, we've been talking all about humility over the last few weeks on Wednesdays, on Sundays. Humility is this, this thing that it connects people. Why? Because it's way easier to listen to somebody when they're full of humility than when they're full of pride. And so if we want to be... Fishers of the lost, we need to understand, man, I, I'm, I'm no good too. If, if I sat up here and tried to communicate this message to you without the thought in my head that I, I was lost, I was a sinner, I was undone, I, I still make mistakes if it wasn't for the grace of God, it would be hard for me to communicate this to you properly if, that's, if I didn't have that attitude. I, we have to take on an attitude that says, man, I'm, I'm a failure, I'm lost, I've been there, I've been there. But Jesus can rescue you. Jesus can save you. Listen, there are many people who have difficulty with this point. Because in our human nature, we want to believe that there's something good about us. We're told by culture and society, believe in yourself. But the Bible says the exact opposite in Romans 3. It says we've all sinned and continually fall short of the glory of God. It doesn't say we've all sinned and then Jesus rescued us and now we're perfect. It says we've all sinned and we continually fall short of the glory of God. That's why we need the righteousness of Christ, like we learned about a couple weeks ago. We need this righteousness in our lives to come into our hearts and into our minds and say, man, I'm going to try my best. I'm never going to get there, but I'm going to try my best to live as righteous as possible because I've sinned and I continually fall short of the glory of God. This story that we've read in in Matthew chapter 4 it's also found in the other Gospels, and the, the, the account, uh, you know, we don't like to play favorites, but Luke really has like the most, <laughs> it's really the best storyteller of the four. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to you know, play favorites, but, and in, in Luke's Gospel, he goes a little bit more in depth into the story, and he talks about how when Jesus gets there, he gets on the boat, and he tells Peter, go cast your nets over there. And Peter, poor Peter, I love Peter, man. He's such a, just a human idiot, you know. He looks at Jesus and says, Master, we've been, we've been fishing all night, and we haven't caught a thing. And Jesus says, just, 
Just go cast your nets over there. And you have to think in your mind. I mean, I, I get it, because again, Peter's human. He doesn't understand who Jesus is quite yet, and he's a fisherman. I'm not going to go walk into a stream with Pastor Andy and say, listen, it's, it's like this. You know? It's like this. You're, you're not really, you're not, you're, not, you're not moving your hips, you know? You're not, you're, not, you're not doing it properly. If I said that to him, he'd look at me and be like, what? Get away from me, right? Because I'm not a fisherman. He's a fisherman. And so you have to understand, like we give Peter a hard time, but it, you have to understand the dialogue that's happening, right? I've, I'm a fisherman. I've been fishing all night. I haven't caught anything. Now you're telling me to go cast my... And so give Peter the credit where credit is due. He does it. And you know the story. If you don't, you go read it for yourself. But he, he casts the nets. All of a sudden, the Bible says he, he catches so much fish in his net that the net begins to begins to tear, begins to break, because there's so much, so much fish in there. And, and, and look, at, look at what Peter does in Luke's account. It says, but when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, go away from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all his companions were completely astounded at the catch of fish which they had taken. Peter understands in this instant, I'm a failure. I, 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 I'm a failure. I'm a sinful, sinful man. I'm not even worthy to be in your presence. This is the type of people that Jesus wants to use. Jesus wants to use the type of people who will bow down before him and say, I, I, shouldn't, even, I shouldn't even be a, a thought to be used by you because I'm a failure. I'm, a, I'm sinful. It's, it, it's so relatable Peter's response is so relatable to where you and I are, because I know I've been there, and I'm sure you have been too, where you look at your life and you go, God, why in the world would you use me to do this? God, why would you choose me for this? My, my, my dad said it before he got up to preach last week, that sometimes he just sits back in awe of like, man, God would like do this, like through, God would like use us to do this. It, it, it's, I was able to go to a, a conference a uh, week and a half ago with some of our, our younger staff. It was a next-gen conference, and so it was all about young adults and youth and kids, and, which I don't really have that much to do with any of those, but they let me go. Uh, and so we went to this conference, and, and while, we were, while we were there, there was incredible, you know, great messages and little breakout sessions where we got to learn a lot, and we had a meeting when we got back, and, and God's going to do some incredible things, or He is doing incredible things through our next-gen department, because we believe in transgenerational Christianity. Right. Amen? Amen? We want you to pass your faith down to your kids, and them to their kids, and their kids, and their kids, and, and we want the cycle to continue. And so that's why we invest so much in our kids, and our youth, and our young adults. And, and, and it was so encouraging to me, but it was... It was it, the, one of the coolest parts of the whole trip was I was sitting next to Pastor Devin, who runs our, our youth programs here, and, and we're listening to this, you know, we're in like the, about the third day, and we're listening to another sermon, and a lot of the sermons were based around, you know, trying to help the people who are at the conference, like, not give up, don't give in, like, it's going to be okay, it's, it's going to, you know, you're going to make it, don't be fearful, just, just pray, just trust the Holy Spirit. And I get it because, you know, the, the culture and the times that we live in, it, 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 it's hard. It's difficult sometimes to, you know, you put your hand to the plow. But I grew up in this church <laughs> where it was like, hey, you're in ministry. You don't get to complain about that. God placed you there. So shut up, grab hold, put one foot in front of the other, and go. Move forward. Mush. You know, like that's, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So if you're sitting there going, well, that's that's harsh, you know, blah. No, it's not. This is what we've been called to do. You think the life of all the guys in the Bible was easy? Have you read the stories? I'll take my life over their life any day. And I sat there and, and, and Devin looked at me and we have a, a, a great relationship and he looked at me in the only way he could and, and he just went, what if you like really like your job? Like this is this is weird. Like they they're really trying to encourage you. Like what if you love your job? I was like, I know, right? I was like, I'm thinking the same thing. I love this. This is awesome. It, but you have to understand this. 
there are moments, there are times, and I'm talking specifically about ministry, but in your own life, when, when God's blessed you or God's done something in your life or God gave you an opportunity to speak into someone's situation or to pray with someone or to speak to your kids about something, do you ever just think to yourself, how, how could God possibly want to use me? But this is the God that we serve. And the good news is in Luke 19, Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This is the whole reason that Jesus came. He says, you're a failure? Good. I can use that. The only people that Jesus didn't want to use when he came were the people who didn't think they were failures. Go read his interactions with the Pharisees and the holier-than-thou religious people of, of the time. Jesus didn't want, he didn't want anything to do with it. He couldn't use them. Why? Because they had this attitude of, well, I'm, per, you know, I'm perfect. I know the law, and I keep this, and blah, blah, blah. Jesus is like, give me, give me the people like Peter that will fall on their knees and say, Jesus, go away from me. I'm a sinful, sinful man. Jesus says, those, those are the people I can use. That's the humility that I need. The second thing that we need to understand is that following Jesus means that you have faith that he will provide everything you need. You need to have faith and trust that Jesus will provide what it is that you need. Verse 20, it says, immediately they left their nets and followed him, becoming his disciples, believing and trusting in him and following his example. I, again, I, I talked about it a couple weeks ago. We know the end of the story, right? We know that it's, oh, this is Jesus. He's going to change their lives. They're going to start the early church, blah, blah, blah. So when you read a verse like this, it's like, oh, great. Yeah, of course they did. It's Jesus. But you have to take everything into context, right? Like they understand sort of who he is, but not fully. And they just caught the biggest catch of their entire lives and then immediately just left it to follow Jesus. Like, can you imagine if, if you closed a sale on Tuesday and it was, a, it was a $40 million sale and Jesus was like, hey, come follow me. And you were like, okay. <laughs> the, the, like, this is the biggest catch of their entire lives and immediately... They leave it all behind, and they go and they follow him. What is that? That's having faith that Jesus will provide. Sometimes having faith means saying yes to him and no to other things. Sometimes it means this looks really attractive. This looks awesome. This is what I wanted, but it's not what God wanted. And so I have to say no to that so that I can say yes to him. I have to say no to that so that I can move in the direction that I want to go in. It means I might have to give that up so that I could get to church when I need to get to church. I might have to give that up so that I can properly tithe. I need to give that up so that I could serve and volunteer. I need to give that up so that I can get my kids here. There are things that you might have to say no to so that you can say yes to Jesus. And this is where the disciples are. They say, we just caught... The no, nah, I, nah, it, it, I want to say yes. I want to say yes to Jesus. Oswald Chambers said, if I'm going to know who Jesus is, I must obey him. The majority of us don't know Jesus because we, ha we have not the remotest intention of obeying him. If that doesn't describe church in 2024, I don't, I don't know what does. We have a whole generation, a whole culture of churchgoers that want, that want everything that Jesus has to offer without putting in the work that Jesus told us to put in. Well, yeah, of course, God, I, I, of course I want blessing. Of course I want you in my life. Of course you want, oh, wait, I have, to, I have to obey you to get all that? Isn't it funny? It always, church life, when you grow up in church and you spend as much time in church as I do, you make these weird observations, and then I think it's because of the personality that I have as well you make these observations of like, why, why does something apply to everything else but not church, right? Like if you want your paycheck from work, guess what you have to do? You have to obey the, work, the rules of work. You have to go to work. You have to be there on time. You have to get your work done. You have to dress the way they tell you to dress. You have to have the code of conduct that they tell you to have. You have to, right? It, at school, you want to graduate. What do you have to do? You have to obey the, every single thing in life. There's rules that apply to it that we follow, sometimes blindly. 
right? It's tax season, right? <laughs> right? Right? And sometimes it's not fair and doesn't make sense. But we do it. Why? Because, well, these are the rules. And then all of a sudden, God's like, hey, listen, if you'll do this, this, and this, I'll bless your life. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I thought I had freedom in my life. God's like, you don't have freedom anywhere in your life. You really don't. You're like, yes, I do. I live in my mom's basement. I don't work. Well, fine, you do. But we, every, every, why all of a sudden do we take a, a, a different tone when it comes to the things of Jesus? Listen, the road that leads to heaven is often risky, lonely, and costly. And few are willing to pay that price, but following Jesus means daily losing your life so that you can find a new and better one in him. It means that you wake up every day and you say, God, I, I die to self today. I die to who I want to be. I want to be who you want me to be because I have faith that you're going to provide everything that you need. Sometimes that means God's going to say no to the things that you want. There's been multiple times in my life where there have been things that I wanted or thought were for me that God's and they weren't listen they weren't horrible bad things that's that's sometimes where we get it confused right we think if something's evil and horrible that of course God doesn't want that sometimes there are good things that God wants for other people but not you because he wants to take you somewhere better he wants to take you somewhere else he has a plan and a purpose for each of us so that means there might be two people on the same path that they think for their lives leading to good things but God says I'm going to take them over there and I'm going to take you over here and we look at it and go no God I want to go over there and God's like just shut up and trust me it's good. if you'll just have faith it's going to be better over here this is what separates true followers how do you react when God doesn't meet your expectation if you truly accepted the invitation to follow Jesus you'll keep going on through storms, trials, hazardous conditions. If you, have, if you have simply invited him to follow you, you'll bail out at the first sign of bad weather. So often we say in our prayers, Jesus, please come here with me. And Jesus says to us, no, come here with me. And we go, no, 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 I want, no, no, I want you to come with, and Jesus, no, come, trust me, come with me. And we get in this argument with Jesus like, like we know better than him. This is what I need. This is what I want. Jesus is like, no, it's not. But I love him, Jesus. <laughs> you knew it was coming. It, it's, just, it's so easy. I'm sorry, single ladies. I'm sorry. But I love her, Jesus. There we go. We'll pick on the guys. She's so hot. And Jesus is like, she ain't going to be forever. Come on. Come this way. <laughs> Quick. Hurry. She's going to be so hot. She's going to take you to hell. Hurry. Come on. <laughs> hurry. Well, we, we argue. We argue. And we try to fight like we know what's best. Jesus says, if you'll just have faith and just trust me that I'll provide everything you need, everything will be okay. Philippians 4, it says, and my God will liberally supply, fill until full. Your every need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Listen, your life is short, Thomas Brooks said. Your life is short. Your duties many, your assistance great, but your reward sure. Therefore, faint not. Hold on and hold up in ways of well-doing, and heaven shall make amends for all. It'll all be worth it in the end. I know life's hard. I know it's challenging. But if you just have faith that Jesus will meet every need. All of a sudden, you can go do what it is that he's called you to do, and that brings me to my third point and my final point. Following Jesus means it's time to start fishing. When I realize that I'm a failure and I'm a sinful man and I, I, I need work, I'm not holier than thou, I'm on the journey myself, but if I can bring other people with me, I want to bring other people with me. I'm going to have faith that he's going to provide everything that I need. That if I step out of this into this and trust God and say, I'm a failure, I'm a sinful man, but God, I want you to use me and I'm going to have faith that you are. The next step is, it's, it's, time, to, it's time to cast the nets. It's time to tell people about Jesus. Listen, a true disciple of Jesus Christ is a visible and verbal follower of Jesus, even at the expenses of the ones and things that they hold dear. 
even at the expenses of people that we might care about. Listen, I know there are times when your kids don't want to come to church. Again, (laughs) rules apply, right? There are days your kids don't want to go to school. You make them go to school. There are days your kids don't want to go to the doctor for a checkup, and you take them to the doctor. You can go through the list. I don't need to. Why would church be any different? You say, well, but it might upset them. It might aggravate them. It might this. It might that. Listen, I grew up, I'm an I'm a 80s, 90s Christian kid. So that means my parents were, you know, 60s, 70s Christians kid. Like, and my parents grew up Pentecostal, so they grew up, you know, they, they couldn't do anything. And so, of course, that carried down to me. Like, I think Jesus had more fun than I did. <laughs> I couldn't, watch, I couldn't watch Ninja Turtles. I couldn't watch, you know, I couldn't watch Power Rangers. I couldn't, I couldn't watch, like, I, I didn't get to go to prom. I didn't get to play AAU because they played on Sundays. I didn't get, you're like, no Smurfs, no Smurfs. <laughs> right? No Scooby-Doo, right? I know what you're thinking. I don't know what he said, but it sounded like somebody needs to get prayed through over there. <laughs> Right? So this is, this is how I grew up. And you're like, that, that's, that's like a prison. That's like a prison sentence. You couldn't get to do anything that you wanted to do. No. It turned out okay. It turned out okay. It, 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 it'll work out. Well, yeah, but didn't you, weren't you super mad at your parents? Didn't you hate them? Weren't you so? I was pretty upset. A couple times here and there, I was pretty upset. Not about Scooby-Doo or the Smurfs. I could get over that. But there were some things in my life that I wanted to do that I wasn't allowed to do. Because my parents knew it's not about what you want. And it's not about what they wanted. It's it's about what Jesus wants. Listen, can I tell you something? It's not, where do I go over here if it's not in the Word? Nowhere in the Bible, Jesus did not call you to raise good kids. He called you to raise disciples. He, he called you to be people where your kids look at you and the stance that you take and the, 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 the heart that you have for his word and for the things of him. He called you to be an example of that to your kids. He didn't call you to be their best, your, their best friend or be their buddy or make them happy all the time. All the teenagers in here hate my guts right now so, <laughs> so bad. But I'm prom- I promise you, young people, it, it, it's, it's worth You know what my parents told me when I was a sophomore, junior in high school? You want to go, go to college, Luke? Yeah, I want to go to college. You want to go to college? You better find a Christian one. What are you talking about? But my friends are going here, and I want to go here, and I, I, I want to play basketball, and I want to go here. We're not paying for it. And when you come home in the summer, you ain't living here. So wherever you go, you better find a job and a house to live in. Well, that's that's hurtful. That's that's hard. That's harsh. It's life, man. They 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 threw everything down immediately to follow Jesus. Why? Because Jesus told them, "I, I need you to do something. Jesus told us, he told you, if you're in here and you got kids, Jesus told you, you you need to start creating disciples at home. Stop stop relying on us to do it. We'll do our best to help. That's why we go to conferences and we have kids and we have youth and we have young adults. But stop relying on us to do your job. Jesus told you, raise up disciples, go be fishers of men. There are too many parents in the church nowadays, too many people in the church nowadays that are more concerned with the lost out in the world than they are with their lost in their homes. Your kids need Jesus. They need you to snatch their phone every now and then and go through it and look and see what are you looking at? What are you texting? What are you saying to your friends? Man, these kids hate my guts right now. I'm sorry. Young people, I'm sorry. Sorry. But this, listen, it, it works. I'm just, I'm just telling you it works because I've seen it in the lives of scores of kids. I've seen the opposite, and I, I've seen 
kids been, been brought up the way that I have because my parents have been an example to other people. And so I've seen kids brought up the way I have, and I've seen kids brought up the opposite way. And it, I'm just telling you, right, the stats are there. Go look it up. It's, it's clear the difference between the two. They might hate you for a season. Teenagers hate everybody anyway. <laughs> You're going to be all right. I promise. It'll all work out. They'll hit like 22 and they'll be like, oh, they were right this whole time. <laughs> it, I'm telling you, I've seen it happen far too, I've seen it happen far too many times. We, we, we need to be the people that God is calling us to be. We need to start raising the people that God is calling us to raise. And we need to learn how to go out and catch fish. Jesus said in Mark 16, he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. In Matthew 9, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the labor, laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Paul said in Corinthians 9, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. This is what we've been called to do. Listen, we have no excuse not to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It would be true negligence of the great commission given directly by Jesus. There is no plan B. We are it. But what about the aliens, Pastor? We are it. We should all be going into the world to share the gospel, even if it's right next door or in our own home. We should be praying to the Lord of the harvest for more laborers, for there are never enough. We should never have regard for anyone, but become all things to all men. We should never be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for we risk Jesus being ashamed of us in the end. This is, listen, I'm preaching this sermon on purpose because this is literally the easiest week of the entire year to be a fisher of men. There are people that are already thinking this week, ah, oh, shoot, it's Easter. Where am I going this Sunday? You know them. There are people that will, wouldn't dream of darkening a door of a church except for one Sunday a year. Whether it's their Catholic guilt, whether they were once saved and they're lost, whether, whatever it is, there's something about Easter that just draws people to church. We have these little cards that we gave out last week. We'll have more that we're going to give out this week. I'd encourage you, take a bunch of them. I'm a big, uh, I hate wasting. If you're anything like me, like if I, if, and if you're like me, what I would encourage you to do is grab a bunch of cards and put them in your car. And, and if it's like Wednesday and there's still, you know, three quarters of the stack there, it'll start to aggravate you because you don't want to waste them. And you'll just start, give them out. Tell people about Jesus. Say, hey, we're having church on Sunday. I'd love for you to come. It's at Trumbull High. There's plenty of room, this and that. Get people to church. Learn, learn how to cast the nets. Amen. Learn how to do what Jesus has called us to do. He said, imitate me. C come, come watch what I do because I'm going to train you up so that you can go out. And we know because when he ascended into heaven, what did he tell us? Go, go out into the world and preach the gospel. Imagine if the disciples heard Jesus say that and they were like, no, nah, we can't, we can't, we could never do it. We wouldn't be here today. They took what Jesus said and through the power of the Holy Spirit that was given to them, they went out and they spread the gospel and we're here today because of that. But we can't let it stop here. We can't say, oh, well, you know, we've done our part. Like, we got to go three services. We have so many people. We're going three services so that more people yeah. can get in the kingdom. And then more people, and more people. And we're praying God will fill all three. Amen. We're not going four, Lord, but we're praying that he'll fill all three. And then he'll give us a building or some land or figure out something or some rich architect, builder, slash, whatever will come to our church and get saved and say, oh, we can do something here. We can push these. We'll figure something out. God will, God will make a way. But listen, it, do we want to go through service? No, of course not. It's a lot of work. This is hard. I'm sweating. <laughs> this is difficult. It's challenging. The, the laborers are few. We need volunteers. We need workers. There's lots of things that make church happen. Is going three easier? No. 
But it's what Jesus has called us to do. He said you need to go out, on the lost, go out into the world and reach the lost. You need to make room. You need to cast your nets. And sometimes I like the way they fish. I, I don't want just the, give me the net. I want to catch a whole bunch. And some of you do it differently. Some of you do it one at a time. Some of you do it with the little scooper net. Some of you do it with a huge net. There's lots of different ways to do it. But if we just sit at home, imagine having, holding on to something that you knew would rescue and save everyone else, but you hoarded it to yourself. God's given you his gift. He's given you salvation. He's given you his love. He's given you heaven. Why would we hold that back from anyone else? I'm done, but I do have five minutes left <laughs> till my time. And I wanted to just leave you today because it is Palm Sunday, and I know what you're thinking. It's Palm Sunday. What, what's Palm Sunday? Luke always preaches Palm Sunday. We talk about Palm Sunday. I, I was thinking in my head because we were doing this chronologically, and I was like, man, how can I tie this into Palm Sunday? How can I? Can I encourage you today? When you realize that you're a failure, when you realize that you need faith for God to do everything that he needs to do in your life, and then in turn, you go out and you go fishing because you've realized these things. Can I encourage you, none of this works if you're not a true follower of Jesus. None of this works if the commitment isn't there. None of this works if you're not truly committed to who Jesus is and what he wants you to do. And we don't see an example of this more clear than the story of Palm Sunday. Because verse 12, it says, the next day when the large crowd who had come to the Passover feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees in homage to him as, as king and went out to meet him. And they began shouting and kept shouting, Hosanna! Blessed, celebrated praises is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it just as it is written in the scripture. Do not fear, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. And verse 16 says, his disciples did not understand the meaning of these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified and exalted, they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. So the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to tell others about him. For this reason, the crowd went to meet him because they had heard that he had performed the, these miraculous signs. Then the Pharisees argued and said to one another, you see that your efforts are futile. Look, the whole world has gone running after him. Jesus enters this city in this prophetical way, riding on this donkey, and the crowds, because of what he's done and what they've heard about him, rush to him, and they put palms down, and they shout Hosanna, and you know the story. This is on Sunday. By Friday, chapter 18, it says, Pilate went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no guilt in him. No crime, no cause for accusation, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover, so I shall release for you the king of the Jews, right? Then they all shouted back, not this man, but Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. On Sunday, they were all shouting because they heard what Jesus can do, but by Friday, they're saying, now nah, give us Barabbas. We need to be people not like this. We need to be people that on Sunday shout Hosanna and say, look, the king of, king of kings, he's here in our midst. He wants to meet with us. But by Friday, we should still be shouting as loud as we were on Sunday. We need to be people that understand in order to imitate the life that Jesus lived, in order to be like Peter and Andrew and throw our nets down and follow him and say, I want to I wanna be fishers of men. I want to do what you've called me to do, God. We need to come to grips with the fact that we're sinful, that we failed, that he has the faith to provide everything that we need. And when we understand those two things, man, I need to put courage on. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. I know it's awkward sometimes, but I got, I got to put some courage on and say, man, do you know about Jesus? Can I pray with you? Can I tell you about Jesus? Would you like to come to church with me? I know it's Easter. Everyone goes to church on Easter. You should come have church with us. 
It's not even at a church, so you won't feel weird. It's at a school. You should come have... How can we this week, and then in the weeks following, as we go three services, how, how can we be people until the end of time? Forget Easter. It's just easy this week. But, but until Jesus calls us home, how, how do we become people where our lives mirror Jesus to a point where we're not, we, we, we can't hold it to ourselves? So I've got to tell people about this Jesus that rescued me, about this Jesus that saved me. I got to learn how to fish. And sometimes that might mean going to someone that's a really good fisherman. You say, well, I've never led anybody to Christ. or I don't really know how to invite. Find somebody that's really good at it. And say, hey, how do, how do you, how, I, know you, I know you brought that person from work. How did you, how did you like start that conversation? How, ask somebody. Pray about it. Say, God, give me opportunities this week. But be ready, because if you pray it, God will do it. Say, God, give me opportunities this week to invite somebody to church, to tell somebody about you, to be a fisher of men, so that I, so that I might be the person that you've called me to be. Help me not to shout Hosanna on Sunday, but Barabbas on Friday. God, help me to be a person that trusts you and knows that you're in control of everything and that you want to see me live out this life that you've called me to. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for the opportunity to be in your house. God, I pray that you would bless your people today, that you'd move in their lives, in their hearts, in their situations. And God, of course, that you'd bless them and you'd touch them and do all that you, that you do in their lives. But God, we're praying today for the lost. We're praying for our upcoming Easter service, for three services the week after. God, we're praying that you would draw people to yourself. And God, that you would help us. We pray that you'd soften the hearts of people at our schools, at our jobs, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, that you would soften their hearts so that maybe when we do cast that net, that they'd be a little bit more pliable. They'd be a little bit more understanding, that we wouldn't just get that hard no that we've been getting, but God, you would soften their hearts to where they would say, well, I'll think about it, or uh, uh, maybe, let me know more about it. God, and I pray that you'd help us to continue casting the real, casting the real, casting the real. Have, help us to have patience. Help us to have love. Help us to have graciousness. But most of all, God, give us courage to do it, to step out in faith and be the people that you've called us to be, that we would like your disciples, be fishers of men, God. We thank you again for the opportunity to be here in your house today. I pray that you bless each and every person as they depart, go their separate ways, keep them safe, help them to have a great holy week, bless them, bring them back Wednesday for Bible study, Friday for Good Friday, and then next Sunday at Trumbull High, help us to pack that place out twice. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have